Now, we come yet again to an ex exposure of those who have passed in time as being so-called men of God, mighty men, giants in the earth as we are told and how we are told indeed and poor young Christians when they first come into the faith how they are beguiled by those whom they should look to and do look to for guidance in the things of God and particularly in who to trust as being faithful ministers of God and what is presented to them nothing but garbage here we have a man Christmas Evans yet another hypocrite in religion that is presented to us and particularly impressed upon us as being a man sent of God. And poor young believers in Christ have not a chance in this world that we live when faced with the eulogies of the likes of this man. They themselves being led astray by those who should be faithful ministers and shepherds and pillars of the faith. But they're not. It is an utter, utter disgrace what is going on. An utter disgrace. This man, Christmas Evans, was often called the John Bunyan of Wales because of his imagination, his pictorial way of imagining the things of Scripture and portraying them in a story like fashion. Personally, behind it all is a wicked spirit that is basically mocking John Bunyan, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because John Bunyan was a fundamentalist. This man, as we shall see, was not a fundamentalist. In no way was he a fundamentalist. He cannot be compared to John Bunyan in his theology, because he had no theology. And his preaching was not, therefore, the same as John Bunyan. In fact, Bunyan, even in his allegories, is fundamental. This man isn't, as we shall see. Now, Evans was born on the 25th of December, 1766. At this time, the Puritan era had ended. We acknowledge that. And a new era had begun. It was taking shape. That era, of course, being one of secular, neo-evangelical, dispensational, end time prophets and all the rest that we have received today and acknowledged today as being the ruling force within Christendom that hellish thing Evans was named Christmas because of the day he was born on which shows doubly does it not the doctrinal era that was being entered upon. That 
There was less and less fear, filial fear of God and doctrine cast to one side. If the Puritans were still around and had a child or heard of a child called Christmas Evans, they would have denounced it as being of the devil. But oh no, Christmas, you see, Christ and the Mass was accepted at this time. Now Evans was born in mid Wales. His father was a shoemaker who died and went to his reward when Evans was eight years of age. Now Evans was fostered out to his grandfather who was a drunkard and a, basically a, a very, very, very nasty man. But Evans survived all that and at the age of 17 he strangely became the servant of a Presbyterian minister named David Davies. Now, whilst being a servant of the Presbyterian minister David Davies, a revival broke out. A religious revival. Ooh, what the terms. And what happened? Well, Evans claims to have been saved, put his hand up, committed his life to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. He saw many persons doing that and eventually falling away. So of course they were losing their salvation according to the doctrine of revivalism. Revivalism, of course, as we know, is of the pit. Absolutely stinks of hell. It's the breath of Satan. That's what revivalism is. The breath of Satan. It is anti-Christian, anti-Reformation. Now Evans declares that shortly after he had made his commitment for Jesus, this little Jesus, you know the impotent Jesus of neo-evangelical revivalism, poor little baggy, you know, needs a new set of teeth, needs new clothes, all worn out, you see. He's got channels down his face where he's been crying over the centuries. For people to come and embrace him. And he's a dodgy old man who goes around with a stick and he's pleading with people, accept me as your Lord and Saviour, will you not, young man? Eh? And he gets down on his knees and he says, oh, come on, accept me. This is the neo evangelical Jesus. The pathetic Jesus. One they bring down in these so called gospel services they bring him down from above they present him to the people as being crucified on a cross the crown of thorns on his head because you see the, the preacher the minister is able to do that he's able to take his creator and bring him down and to have him Crucified again, it puts to an open shame on a cross before the people. And to say, he's, here he is, he's died for you. And then to say at the conclusion of their service, I have lifted up Jesus Christ. And there is an altar call for persons to tread the aisle. Hmm? And this is what he was involved in. This Christmas so-called Evans. And so people go forth towards this metaphorical mass, because that's what it is. The minister in the pulpit having brought Christ down, what blasphemy, utter blasphemy. 
as though the creature could take hold of the creator, dethrone Jesus Christ, rip off his robes, rip off the crown and have him to be nailed to the cross again. A Roman cross and put to an open shame. How oh, the devil in these people laugh and mock and scorn whenever this is preached. What wickedness. And then like the priest of Rome to uplift this so-called Christ. And then have people to walk an altar to accept of their sins to be forgiven. This sacrament that comes through the metaphorical altar that if Cromwell was around he'd drag the minister out of the pulpit and throw him out. Of all the metaphorical altars that they have brought in. Absolute paganism. Baal worship. Now, this man, Evans, claims that once he was converted, committed his life to Christ, that he began to learn <coughs> to read because at this time he couldn't read. He was totally ignorant. He was not only illiterate, but he couldn't read. So he said, oh, I began to read. And I taught myself English and Welsh within a few months. Also Latin and some Greek. And so it was that he began his education. Now, he went on to join the Baptist Church having been influenced by Calvinist Methodists. <clears throat> That's a term within itself, is it not? Calvinist Methodists. Now in 8, 17, 1789 he went from his home in South Wales into North Wales as a preacher. And he settled in North Wales in a place called Lynn in Carmarthenshire. He settled there for two years. Then he went into Anglesey, across the Menai Bridge and into Anglesey where he is said to have built a strong Baptist community. And what is more, whilst there, he said that he founded more and more chapels, and that he increased the congregations within the founding chapel that he'd come to, as well as, as we say, founding other chapels. Now, in order to do the building of these chapels, he took on debts, and of course he then went on to a travelling ministry, particularly to the south, in order to raise money to clear off the debts and to build more chapels. In, on Anglesey, on the island, island of Anglesey. So he went off on his tours, his preaching tours around the south of Wales. Now, in 1826, <clears throat> Evans accepted an invitation to become a minister in Caerphilly, which is quite some distance away which he accepted. Equally, he stayed there for two years. Just about two years. When, of course, his people in Caerphilly, whom he was preaching to, fell out with him. You see, it they fell out with him in Anglesey as well. And throughout all his ministry, all the chapels that he went into they fell out with him after a time they thought he was the bee's knees at the beginning 
when they invited him, but they then began to realise over time that this man is despotic. He's an absolute despot. And it turned out that he was a despot. <clears throat> so in the end, he only lasted a short while in these places. Of course, he was removed in 1828, and uh, he took on a ministry in Cardiff. <clears throat> now, he lasted a, a little bit longer there, for, for about four years. So, in 1832, we have him seen again, settled in Carnarvon, in North Wales. So he's edging himself back <clears throat> towards Anglesey, towards Bangor, towards that district, Carnarvon with its castle and all that. Now he settles in, <clears throat> in there again and again he took to building chapels. And whilst he was doing this, on his last tour, his preaching tour to collect the cash, he ended up dying and was buried. The place, of course, of his last preaching was in Swansea, basically Cardiff, in Swansea, on July the 19th, 1838. And so it was <clears throat> that his ministry was ended. He himself gone forth to the judgment. For him, judgment indeed. Now, whilst he was in the centre of his ministry, Evans declared that for some years this was particularly when he was in his Anglesey ministry, he became dead within his preaching. Because he had been drawn into Sandemanianism, a very pernicious <clears throat> doctrine of the times. It was called Glassite theory in Scotland or Sandemanianism in England and in Wales of course and it was basically the idea that man is no more than the sum and substance of his being and that being so he could make an intellectual acceptance of salvation and the taking of Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. It was merely a mental affirmation that Christ was Lord and Saviour and that the things of the Bible were true. It was a mental positivism. It is still a mental positivism because it still remains within us, that is, within Christendom. Featured in Sandemanianism, uh, rather neo evangelicalism. Sandemanianism is that feature within neo evangelicalism that says we can reason you into salvation. And at the end of the day, if you take the Lord and Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you will be saved, just as long as you confess afterwards. That the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour, you are saved. It doesn't matter about Matthew 7, 22, 23, does it? Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Hmm? No, 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 no. No, no. Sandy money in this one, you see, pushes that to one side. And every <clears throat> fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Now, the peculiar thing here with Evans is that he said he took the teaching of Sandy Manninus. How can he 
If he were a Christian, of which he was not, he was a nominal Christian who committed his life to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. Now that's not Christianity, that's pseudo-Christianity. However, having this false religion, he was open to Sandemanianism. Because, you see, a person that has come through the regeneration, who's born again, cannot go the Sandemanianism way. It's impossible because he knows it's a false way. He knows it's the way he didn't come. He knows that he came by law and faith. That the law was his schoolmaster to bring him to Jesus Christ to be justified by Christ. He knows that. So he preaches that. He speaks that. He can't speak any other way, because that is the way he came, struck down as Paul was by the law, to find the soul in the fearful hands of a wrathful God, and to see the blackness and darkness of conviction of sin, to stand and fear dying and equally fear living in distress, conviction of sin, rending the heart, great tribulation within, to the conversion of the soul. That is the experience of every elect child of God, as is written in Revelation 7 verse 14. These are they that came through great tribulation, that's conviction, to the washing of their robes, making them white in the blood of the Lamb, that's conversion. And that is spoken of the church collective. Every member. And let's not forget Revelation 15 verse 3, where they sing the song of Moses, and the song of the Lamb, because Moses, the law, came first, and then justification comes second. So we praise and exalt the law of God as our schoolmaster that brought us to Jesus Christ, whom we sing about, because they have both brought us to justification by faith, spotless before God, with eternal salvation. So this man could not have been saved if he did not know the way of salvation. That is obvious. But you know, at the same time, he professed to be a staunch Calvinist. So how can you have Sandemanianism with staunch Calvinism? You can't. It's two opposites. But, of course, you see, this is how it was in those days, and it still is. But more so in those days. Because <clears throat> this man could accept Sandemanianism, Universalism, because Universalism is attached to Sandemanianism. The throwing out of justification by faith for the... Justification by works, infused righteousness of Romanism, and every other doctrine that is false towards Christianity he could imbibe, whilst declaring himself to be a Calvinist. That's how it was. You see, in the 1800s, when neo-evangelicalism had solidified itself then a middle road was established. What was that middle road? It's that middle road that still exists. Go into a um, Calvinistic church, say, and you can hear universal Romanism being preached, and you approach the minister and say, why do you do that? You're supposed to be staunch Calvinist. Yes, well, I don't know who is going to be saved, therefore I preach universal salvation. But that is cancelling out Calvinism. You are two-faced. You've got guile. You're not an honest man. You lie. And all liars will have their share in their pit. In hell. 
in hell fire and damnation so you have just shown yourself by your words to be condemned and these brats go away so it is that people can believe in election while speaking of non-election double standards lying through their teeth If they were Calvinists, <clears throat> they would leave the matter unto God. They'd preach the love of God as the schoolmaster to bring souls to Christ. They'd leave the whole lot, but they're not. They're liars, hypocrites in religion. They will bear face lighters. This is all they are, liars of the first order. Now, the first sermon that Evans preached, this great man of God, it is said, and he claimed it was taken from Beveridge's Thesaurus Theologicus. And what he did was he committed this, a sermon that he found in this work to his memory and presented it to <clears throat> other people as his work. He assembled himself into a cottage one Lord's Day and he preached the sermon as being his sermon that he had put together. He had equally presented his prayer as the prayer that he had put together, that he had penned. However, all was stolen from other people and there was one member of the congregation there in this little cottage who realized what Evans was doing and that he pulled him up challenged him he told him that this is not your sermon it is another's and then of course being embarrassed Evans then turned around and owned up that even his prayer was that of another. Copied, memorised and presented again as his own. Now, as we have said, he was a universalist who professed Calvinism. Even baptism of the Holy Ghost yeah, he believed in the baptism of the Holy Ghost for power in the life. But hang on a minute, he's a Calvinist. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> As we say, the times were beguiling times, deceitful times. People could say, I'm a Calvinist, and yet believe in universal salvation. And believe and preach and teach that you needed to be baptised in the Holy Ghost to have power for the life. You see how they contradict one to the other? Something has to stand. And what these boys do is they first of all say I'm a Calvinist and then they establish the wickedness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and all the rest of it, universal salvation, that there is no imputed sin, that there is no bondage of the will, there is no limited atonement, there's no perseverance of the saints. There is no total depravity, there is no seed of Satan and seed of Christ, and so on and so on and so forth. This is what they do, these deceivers. And we see it all too often today. You know, all his sermons were totally and utterly wishy-washy. Mush. Absolute mush. They were non-doctrinal, non-theological. He did not want anything of the Christian doctrine to be heard. It was just utter, absolute tosh what he preached just like the rest of them total unorthodoxy along with it and this 
supposedly is a Calvinist and we are reminded of that brat of hell C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, what a brat of hell he was. What a liar. And the rest of them, Moody's, Billy Sundays, Tories. You see what they preached like this man here? His total entertainment. Listen to their sermons, listen to what they say, and it's pure, pure entertainment, tickling the ears. This is what they wanted. The people wanted it. But the individuals here and there saw these people for what they were. But what happens? Like Evans, he was written up by the Neo-Evangelical Party, which is the largest party in Christendom as being a man of God, powerfully used of God, and that he saved souls, hundreds of souls, for Jesus. They could do this because they are the largest party. Prior to the Reformation, what was the largest party? Romanism. Imperial Holy Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, okay? The holy, so-called Holy Roman Empire. Hopes ruling. History written up by these beggars. And what has happened when they were, were defeated? And when it came to an end, official end in the 1800s? When the holy so-called Roman Empire finished completely in the 1800s, what took over? Its daughter, Neo-Evangelicalism. That's what it took over, and that is the predominant party today. And it's the Evanses, the Christmas Evanses, that are promoted by this party as being the great men and of God. Even they have women, great women of God, in pulpits. But that's how it is. A great soul winner who taught the baptism <coughs> of the Holy Ghost. And it was all absolute tosh what he preached. Do you know, he started out, he said, upon his ministry because he had a dream of the judgment day. And that spurred him on to get into the ministry. What a load of tosh. What a load of tosh. He wanted it because he saw in a revival that people were flocking forwards and they were getting the praise. The minister was getting the praise. So he wanted some of what they say today is some of the action. Like all of them. Like the John Nelson Darby's. Like the Schofields. The Moody's. They all had this desire to be seen of men. So they ran from the pulpits. Even though they were God, ungodly men. The most ungodly men you'd ever meet. Aside from psychopaths, who are evil. Now we'll come to back to this in part two.